Welcome to the Three Haunted Podcast, where we bring you all things horror, supernatural, folklore, mythology, and all things that go bump in the night. What's up, everybody? This is your co-host, Ashley Lunar Goddess, guerrilla girl filmmaker and horror-loving cinephile. I'm just your average podcast-producing badass. I'm John Thomas. Some would say that I go a little too far with my love of all things horror, paranormal, and meta, but I say... Talk nerdy to me, and I'm all yours. What's up, goals, gals, and all of our meta pals out there? In today's episode, we'll be discussing psychic mediumship, Reiki healing, and astrology with our special guest, psychic medium, Annie Larson. Welcome to the show, Annie. Thank you for having me, Ashley. Hello, everyone. Hello and Hello. welcome. Also with us today is special guest host BJ Segura. Hello, BJ. Always Hello. lovely when you can join us. Yay. Oh, yes. I love coming on, guys. It's awesome. Okay. So first up, I mean, we've had the pleasure of getting to talk to Annie a little bit prior to hitting record, so now I've got even more questions. But <laughs> let's first dive into the big topic, at least for me, in terms of how do you know if you're a medium? Because you're a psychic medium, and I know we were discussing how you read an article about, you know, how can I know? So could you walk us through that? So, th- so ways that you might know that you're a medium is one – you have spirits coming to you. So because like me, I'm a naturally born medium. I started having spirits coming to me as a very young child. And sometimes it was frightening, but that's one of the ways that you might know you are a medium. And I'm not talking about your own family coming to you. So if you have like your grandparents who passed and then they come to visit, that would be very normal. I think that everyone can connect with their own family members and maybe even close friends. But how you know you're a medium is you'll have everyone's relatives coming to you who are on the other side wanting to wanting you to get like messages to maybe their friends and family. And you have mentioned there are different types of mediums, right? There are different types of mediums. So you have things like um, psychic mediumship, and that would be under the the subtitle of mental mediumship or evidential mediumship. So you actually have clients come to you and you give them pieces of information that they can connect to that you've got their loved one on the other side. And then from there, you'll deliver things like maybe memories and stuff that they shared You might take on the body movements. You actually get the personality and stuff of the person who steps forward. And that really separates mediumship from psychic because you might get psychic information about the person on the other side. But when you actually start getting the personality, that's when you're really getting into mediumship. And then also sharing any messages. It doesn't mean they always have messages, but sometimes they do have messages or they may come through with some warnings or they may come through because you're getting ready to get married and they're trying to tell you they're going to be at the wedding. And that might be some of the evidence that they share. And then there's other types of mediums. A physical medium is one who actually has physical things happening around them. Um, If you look at some of the old seances, you know, where people had uh, ectoplasm forming, which mediums can form when they're in a trance state, and then you have um, the ectoplasm forms so that your voice box can become a voice for spirit. And then you may have trumpets playing. And if you look at the spiritualist church in the late 1800s, that's the way that they did seances and stuff. And then there's other types of mediums, too. You may be a trance medium where you go into a trance and allow spirit to speak through you. And that's a lot of fun um, to have spirit actually blend with you and then speak through you. And then there's channeling. So channeling is... When you have um, a specific spirit that comes through, I know that people, a lot of people have heard of Seth or they've heard of Abraham, where you've got um, people that channel very specific spirits that share uplifting information about maybe what's happening with 
the world and human beings and helping us evolve. So those really are like the four categories of mediumship. And then there's subcategories below there, especially with evidential or mental mediumship of what type you might be in uh, an intuitive uh, medium, or you might be a psychic medium. So there's different types of mediums under that. I had a question. How long, so you said you, you've done this for a really long time now. When did you first, I guess, figure it out? And how did you almost not like trigger it, but like, how do you, how do you, um, increase it? How do you make it? So it's something that, um, that can grow. Cause that's, that's, yeah, I understand. Yeah. Um, so if you think about, and, and I use this in the article that I wrote, I use Yo-Yo Ma. So he's a very famous cellist, right? He came into this world with natural musical abilities. His parents recognized, hey, every instrument he picks up, he knows how to play. When he was four years old, they said, what musical instrument do you want to play? And he said, I want to play the biggest instrument you can find. So they went and got a cello because that was the biggest instrument. They brought it home. And so they supported him and he took lessons. So he developed muscle memory, how to play the cello and became better and better. Mediumship is the same way. So if you're born into it or there's catalysts that can trip you into mediumship, sounds kind of strange tripping you into it, but it can, it can um, maybe develop you into a medium. But uh, it's, a, it's a muscle that you have to develop. So you have to be trained, I believe, you have to be trained to really get good if you plan to offer readings for people. When did you first discover that you had a gift for mediumship? I knew that there were spirits around me when I was very young, maybe like three. And I didn't know at the time, because at three years old, you don't really have a great sense of reality. But I knew that there were other people around me, aside from my parents and my siblings. It wasn't until the age of five where I actually had a spirit approach and then my sister was with me, so I got confirmation because she sensed it too. So I got confirmation that, yes, this is really happening. And then from there, I've always had an interest in the paranormal. I've always played with Ouija boards. I used to read cards. I read tarot cards. I've just always had this interest. And when I was really young, I was very drawn to haunted places because mediums get a sense no matter where we are that spirits around us like i live in an area of virginia that has a lot of battlefields it's a tough place for a medium to go because when you know the soldiers who have fallen there's a lot of tragedy there and they may not really realize that they're gone and maybe they're still trying to get a message home or there may be residual energy there which is you're just seeing kind of a a repeat of a pattern of tragedy that's there. But anyway, um, so with mediumship, it's just something that you you know it when you have it, because for me, I can't turn it off. I can ignore it, but I always know when spirit's around. And that's one of the things, too, that, um, you know, for me, I don't believe that people can go, oh, I want to be a medium, I'm going to go study. I think there's got to be something there, just like Yo-Yo Ma had this propensity. I just don't think anyone, well, maybe they can. Like if you say, wow, I really want to play the cello. So you go and you buy a cello and you start taking lessons and stuff. But will you ever become what Yo-Yo Ma became? You know, maybe not. Or maybe it would take an entire lifetime for you to get there. You have mentioned with transmedium and channeling, there's a difference. And is it, I think, I just want to make sure I understood it correctly. So with transmediumship, you're um, connecting to one specific, or no, it's any spirit that presents itself. And then channeling is one specific spirit. Is that, did I get That's that right? typically what people 
do like, um, or that's typically how they delineate because in trance you could, I mean, technically you're going into trance to channel, right? But with trance, we have different levels of, of, um, of trance that we go into. And in fact, I'm doing a workshop at a metaphysical uh, church in, I believe it's March. Um, but there's different levels and it's how much control you want to give over to spirit that you could do light control where, you know how when you're driving a car and you don't know how you get like from home to work? Well, th think about that. That's kind of a trans state, isn't it? You kind of lose all memory. You're just driving and you're not really thinking about what's going on and you're probably processing things. And you may even have some things come like intuitive things or maybe you figure out decisions has that ever happened to you guys? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> More times than it should have. I go on autopilot. <laughs> well, think about that. I think the first light, light stages of trance are really autopilot. Only with medium, you're allowing spirit to actually come in and blend with you and maybe give you information and stuff. So trance and channeling, when you call somebody your channeler, they typically have one that they're channeling. If you look at Edgar Casey, who was called the sleeping prophet, I think most people have heard of him, but they, he was a channeler. He had, he would go into the Akashic records or the book of life, whatever you want to call it and gather information and come back. But he would go into full trance. He would go to sleep. And then he had his secretary who would write everything and I think he's one of the only mediums ever who is and was 100% accurate. That's crazy. I have a question. Um, I was I was listening to a podcast that you did not too long ago um, that you, or maybe it was a while ago, but you were talking about your parents and how um, you talked to your, or you your dad, he noticed you. like, And there was a difference between your, your mom and your dad. Um, when you had your surgery, when you had gone through. And my question is, I thought it was very interesting. I wasn't able to listen to all of it, but the reincarnation element of it, where spirits can choose to connect with you and how that connects with reincarnation. And I was wondering, like, is that, are these, are the spirits that are connect or talking to you or that channel that talk to you, do they, are they, going to be reincarnated or can you talk to spirits that don't choose that or am I missing something <laughs> no you know that's that's actually a great question you're kind of coming in and out so I think I know you're talking about the uh, time when I had surgery and met up with my parents and then how does reincarnation when I'm talking to spirit I'm not really talking to them about their plan what they're going to be doing next whether they're going to reincarnate or not and I think that that's probably everyone's uh, decision as to whether they're going to reincarnate or not um, I do know I've done one reading in my probably lifetime, it's the only one where I was really aware that spirit was back on earth so that they had already reincarnated and I knew that they were back on earth. So that was, that was an interesting reading. That, that is interesting. How do you know though, that like, what is the, I guess not whether or not they've chosen to reincarnate, but I think you were saying something about the spirits um, that do connect with you, they are going to reincarnate? Or is that just like a belief system? Um, well, it's, uh, I believe in reincarnation. I believe that we have lessons. And I think this earthly plane is one of the schools where we learn things because of gravity, or it's the only place where we're in, or one of the only places where we're embodied. And it's one of the only places where maybe you can experience pain, strangely enough. Um, but whether you decide to reincarnate or not, I'm not, I'm not quite sure. As I always say, when I pass, I'll come back and let you all know. 
<laughs> but for me, I don't want to reincarnate. I don't want to come back to this earthly plane. I find it um, a difficult place to be. You know, there's pain, there's suffering and all of this. And there's happiness and joy too. But for me, I'm kind of like, I'm done. I don't want to come back. I do a lot of things in various religious beliefs, even though I'm not religious at all, so that I don't come back. But do I have a choice? I'm not quite sure. I'm a, a tantric yoga teacher, and tantric yoga is believed that um, when you practice, it might be a shortcut <laughs> to enlightenment and not having to come back. But again, you know, I don't think we'll really know until we pass whether we're going to reincarnate or whether we become enlightened or whatever. But in the meantime, I'm doing everything not to reincarnate. As a Reiki practitioner, you connect to other people's energy to help them heal, right? Yes, I work with their uh, bio field or their aura or their energy field. Yes. Do you think that because you're able to connect to the energy of spirits as well, that kind of helps with the Reiki practitioner? Do you think they're kind of related in any way? Oh, there's no question they're related. Really, if you think about it, and again, I wrote it in this article for the magazine, that Reiki is really, we're channeling Reiki energy. So really, it's it's a form of channeling, but we're channeling a specific energy to come in and help with, we call it healing, but really what I think it is, is um, bringing the body back into balance. So when we bring the body back into balance, then you're taking care of dis ease, not being in ease anymore is out of balance and being back in ease is balance. So it's bringing the energy back into balance, which would then heal somebody. So it's a good question. It's a good question about Reiki and channeling. Now with Reiki and channeling, you know, connecting to these various energies, whether it be connected to a human or um, a spirit, how do you protect yourself from those connections? I don't believe in protection at all. I believe that if you think you need to be protected, then you're living in fear. I do believe in good and evil. And if I feel something funky about the energy of a spirit approaching, I'll just say, no, we're not doing this. You know, you, you need to move away. And I won't engage. And because I have dominion on this earthly plane, I don't believe that spirit can, they don't have dominion. They can't do anything. Now, I say that, but I had some really bad experiences when I was younger. But I think it's the inexperienced mediums that get picked on and some bad things can happen. Or people who are arrogant about going into spirit world because it's a totally different plane. Um, I know like on Ghost Adventures, when Zach first started, he was doing the craziest things by saying, come out here and, <laughs> and fight us spirits. And, you know, I think he got a little smack down. So I, I wouldn't do that kind of stuff. You know, I always say place your energy where you want your energy. I wouldn't go into a bad part of town at three in the morning and start screaming because <laughs> then one, someone's probably going to come out and do something. So with that, you know, I don't believe in protection, but I'll be careful where I place my energy maybe. So having those boundaries ahead of time and knowing what situation not to put yourself into is all you need. <laughs> well, you know, I think, I think you, Ashley, you hit on it, boundaries. And it's what I teach because I teach psychic, medium, and intuitive classes in Reiki. But boundaries are the biggest thing that I teach. Not only boundaries with spirit, but boundaries with other people too. So I think that's just really important of how you're going to work with spirit. So I just, I really don't believe in protection because I think the moment somebody thinks they need protection, they're in a fear mode, 
And when you're in a fear mode with spirit, God knows what you're going to invite in. So I just wouldn't do it. That makes sense. You mentioned that you do teach um, or you're going to be teaching the trance channeling. How, how do you guide, how does one guide another person into that state and kind of keep them tethered or do you, I guess maybe the question is how does that work? (laughs) It's, it's teaching, it's walking them through it. So it's walking them through it in a safe environment and teaching them how to work with the energies. So um, I think everything I do, I think people feel safe around because you've got somebody there who knows how to bring somebody out. Like I do believe and in fact, I, I've seen some shows and stuff, too, because I love watching paranormal shows. But I have seen people get possessed. And in my own life, I've seen people get possessed. And I do believe that spirit can overstep their boundaries. So you have to be experienced to know how to kick spirit out. <laughs> and you always need a really experienced person there to do that. So again, it goes back to we have dominion on this earthly plane that spirit does not have. They don't have a body. So if you remember that, then there's ways of getting people out of difficult situations like that. I know for um, quite a few people with gifts this season, (laughs) we've talked about the dream world and how some people don't feel as protected in their dream state. Like they're pretty open to messages and communication and don't really have that, that boundary of controlling, like this is not allowed to invade this space. Is there anything you can speak to with that? So for me, I think it's just probably a practice because when I'm in the dream state, I mean, I'm very open and honest, and I tell people I sleep with the light on, because if I sleep in the darkness, I'll wake up in a room full of spirit. (laughs) I mean, I just think sometimes there's just not much you can do. I count on my dreams to give me my own messages. It does bleed over into my practice, because sometimes they come through and send me messages about some of the clients I'm going to have. I appreciate it. But I kind of tell spirit, this dream state is mine, and I really want it just for myself. So let's just keep that just for me. I don't know. I think if people live in fear, if they're afraid of sleeping because something will happen, or they're afraid of going into a house because something will happen and all of that, I don't think they should do this work. It it really is probably as simple as that. I, I think that fear brings in a lot of not good. Oh yeah. And I think, um, one thing that I've talked about is, is dreams as well. And I think for me, most of my gifts, I guess you could say are connected to that and only that, which is not a fear for me, but something I look forward to. And it's something that that's, yeah, it's, 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 I've had some connections where, you know, where I have died and I come back and it's been, one of those things that I don't know, it's, it's so, it was so so overwhelming that I, I had this out of body experience and I came back and when I woke up, I didn't know where I was. I didn't know who I was. So that was like the first time I've ever felt something where I had to like, like really like take an inventory of my mind and be like, am I like, who am I? Like, where am I? Like, what is this? And one of the first people that popped in my head was my mom. And I was like, Oh, I'm okay. Like I, my mom's here. Like I'm in, I'm here. I'm, I'm in Colorado. Like, all right. Like I got my bearings now, but like, it was such a, uh, amazing experience I would say, because I did feel like I went to heaven and I had this overwhelming feeling of love and there wasn't a sense of mind necessarily. It was like a, a sense of spirit and, um, love that, that, really, it was kind of like, it felt like mind didn't matter in that space. And then when I came back, that was gone. And then there was my mind. (laughs) And I was like, wait, what's, what's going on? So it was, it was incredible. And 
I would love to know how to develop something like that because it's it's not something that happens obviously all the time, but I think it would be fun to explore. So, so BJ, I think for you, it's setting intention. If you're starting to get stuff in dreams, I mean, that's really with me when I was younger, how much dreams came true. And that, and I still count on dreams to tell me about what's going on in my life and stuff and what's coming. So I think dreams are really important. And I love how you weren't afraid. And I love how you grounded yourself by thinking of your mom. Um, that state that you were in, which you called heaven or whatever, that that to me, I think, is going back to that place of love or back to that place of source. So I think that's really beautiful. And for you, it would be starting to take classes to develop outside of a dream state, getting your mind into that area where you could start learning how to bring in things. Cause, yeah, because I think that only in my dreams is kind of that trance, right? For me, it's like the the way for me to get there. Whereas if I'm awake, I don't know what to do. So we can get you. We can get you there when you're awake. In the dream state, it probably is a really safe place for you right now, right? Mm-hmm. So that's probably part of it. But I think most people, most mediums, do do a lot of the dream state. I mean, I think a lot of things come through that way. There's some pretty common things amongst mediums and how they develop and how they develop naturally. Yeah, because for me, I, I don't. It's not like I'm trying. It's. I mean, it's more like you know. So for me, sometimes when you you try to train yourself, then nothing happens. <laughs> but uh, like sometimes I'll try to like go to sleep, but like right before I'm sleeping, I try to put my mind in some place where I can lucid dream right which happens sometimes and ashley is actually probably the the best of us when it comes to lucid dreaming and um i feel like that's got to be a form of mediumship as well right um that's not mediumship but putting yourself in lucid dreaming i think is more you're controlling your mind a little bit better and when we get control over our mind then we can start training it to get things psychically and maybe getting into that state could lead to then working with spirit. So yeah, it's possible. Um, I do think with the, you know, right before you go to sleep, that's a really safe time and you, you actually are going into naturally an alpha state. So when you're in that alpha state and then dropping into theta and maybe delta states of sleep, that that's where things come in because you don't have any preconceived notions. You don't probably don't have the fear. It's just a really safe place. And it's a safe place, too, because a lot of people have dreams about their loved ones. And I call them dream visits. Because I think it's just a really safe way for spirit to come in and talk to someone that where where the person won't be afraid. It, it, it's interesting because you know, like in your dreams, you know when you're just dreaming about someone who's gone and processing that kind of grief and missing them, and when you know something's different, like. I don't know how to explain that. Just the idea that this is coming from me versus this is external to me, someone coming to me. So it's quite an interesting um, aspect when that happens. But I feel like for those that are experiencing that, if you have a fear of it, you'll question it. But if you don't fear it and you just trust it, then you know. You know that this is something different. This is something I important that I need to pay attention to, whether it's a message or something else. Right. And I, I just think that that's just such a, a safe space for people to be in. Because then you don't have the thinking mind getting involved. You don't have that left brain going, this is kind of scary. <laughs> you shouldn't be doing this. I think one thing that I've noticed um, that you've brought up a lot is is fear, right? And fear seems to be a, a big um, big thing for people that are getting into this 
this field, right? Um, and I feel like that's that is such such a big thing that maybe um, something that hinders people from being able to to really dive into what they to open themselves up, right? Is that something that you've encountered a lot throughout your life, either personally or when you're training other people? Oh, definitely when I'm training other people. I mean, it's nice when I'm training people because they have a resource to go to. So when they are afraid or things are strange, because I've had people that start having physical activity in their home, and that can be frightening. And so it's nice to have a resource to say, hey, this is happening and to have somebody put your mind at ease that, okay, well, let's tap in and see what's going on. But yeah, I, th- I think, uh, you know, think about how we're raised. We're not raised. I mean, when you go to school, you're not raised to connect with spirit or talk with, you know, your animal guides or anything like that. We're, we're a very concrete society and there's very self-limiting beliefs that I think religion and other things come into play. And I think most of it is because, you know, that's how you control people. You can't control free thinkers and people who are going to do their own thing and talk to spirit and get their own information. So I just think that, you know, we're a complicated society and I don't think we're raised with our intuition and we're not raised to use our gut. And if you listen to most business people who are very successful in business, they'll say, well, I had a gut feeling about something. So you made a good point about the fear creating the, some of those dynamics, drawing things in that are not ideal. And I think that translates into the dream world as well. So if you're living in fear, in your waking world and you go to bed with that fear kind of, even if it's under the surface, that's also translating into your dream state because I've struggled with, and these guys know that, uh, I've been very strongly attached to my dream state (laughs) for better or for worse, like sleep paralysis and lucid dreaming. Yep. All of that since I was, since I can remember since I was probably about four or five and, it's been a consistent just part of my life. And, you know, I've talked about how I've been, I I have an ability to dream jump. I can change my entire dream from one to another, but it was born out of fear because as a child and even as an adult, there were certain dreams where you just know this isn't, you know, this isn't coming from me where I felt like I was being um, hunted and in, in, in within my dream Wow! by something external to me. And my solution to that versus waking up is, well, I'll just change the dream. And I'm essentially changing the dream four or five times because this, whatever presence it is, is kind of going from dream to dream after me. So, Ashley, have you ever turned around and just faced whatever's chasing you and say stop? Um, I've never said stop, which would be great. Uh, (laughs) So if you can lucid dream, like that really is training your mind. Mm -hmm. And if you can change your dreams, which it sounds like you can, which is all that part of lucid dreaming. But to me, you know, maybe one night be brave enough to turn around and just say stop it. You have no dominion here. Stop it. I need to do that. And, it, you know, you make it sound so simple. And it's like, maybe it is that it simple. Really, <laughs> it really, really is that simple. But, you know, we watch all these shows. And believe me, I love them all. I love paranormal shows. I've been watching them since I was a kid. I love them all. I don't care, you know, how crazy or hokey they get. I just love them. But I think that it. I think those shows alone bring up a lot of fear. You know, it's like people are always talking about, well, how do you keep the demons away? And how do you keep the demons from possessing you? And I'm like, well, first off, there's no demons. (laughs) So let's just address that. (laughs) So, and, and I've been in places where I'm really scared. I've had some really bad things happen to me. It's actually what in my late 20s, it made me leave doing this work. I came back into this work about 20 years later, kicking and screaming, going, I'm not doing this, but here I am. The one thing I would say, though, to you, Ashley, if you're uh, having sleep paralysis, like, that's really scary. So for me, like, there's ways that you can work around that, too. 
where you can do some relaxation in your lucid dream to bring yourself out of that sleep paralysis. Because I've dealt with it for so long, I've, I've figured out how to make myself come out of it, but there's that very uncomfortable space in between where what presents itself when I'm in between, I call it in between worlds, <laughs> when I'm in between worlds, uh, what presents itself. And most of the time, it's just annoying, the sounds, the over-exaggerated sounds, and um, it's, it's very stimulating. But for the most part, it's not too bad. But there have been occasions where things present themselves and I'm like, oh gosh, nope, I need to wake up. And there's the vulnerability, but I think to what you've been saying, it's the fear, the fear that I have to really come to terms with. And I like the way you said it, that on this human plane, they do not have dominion. And even if that's within my dream state, that's still my dominion and So for me to come to terms with that, that, hey, this is my dominion. This is my space. You're not allowed here. I wish more people, I I guess maybe that's why I do so many podcasts and stuff. It's it's trying to get people out of this fear state and to try to bring some normalcy. Like I'm a medium and I always say to people, you don't need me. You you can connect with your own loved ones. They can come to you. But I understand that they don't trust themselves. And a lot of times, too, like when I'm doing psychic readings or mediumship readings, especially psychic, I'm like, look, I'm not te- I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. You don't need me. Uh, you're just getting confirmation from me. And and with uh, mediumship, I'm like, I'm sure spirit is trying desperately to get in touch with you you're just not paying attention so here let me give you some things to pay attention to so that you have the ability to communicate with your own loved ones i I really believe we've just lost our way as human beings you know we are spirit having a human experience i do think we're supposed to have our human experience and experience all the great and awful things about you know this dimension of earth But at the same time, we have to remember that we're spirit. And how I see people first is their spirit. I see their, like, you know, their light before I see anything else. Is that something, is that why you do what you do? That you either want to help people get over that fear or, and you said you, you also love the ghost shows and all of that. Is it, is it that, is it something that, you like to go to these places yourself? Like, is it a curiosity thing? Is it, is it, what is it that really draws you into what you do? So, so for me, I never, I didn't, I loved doing this work when I was younger until I had some bad experiences. And then when I came back into this work, I absolutely didn't want to do readings for people. I, I wanted nothing to do with any of this, but I couldn't shut off my connection. I, You never lost that all my life. But what really brought me back into this was spirits started coming whether I wanted them there or not. And they were telling me things about the people around me, whether I wanted to know it or not. And when I finally started sharing some of my stories, it was, or you know, from spirit sharing what they were saying, I watched their faces go from grief to resolution. I saw them heal right in front of me. When I do readings for people and reconnect them with their loved ones, because normally there's unfinished business or there's some guilt or there's something that we as a human being are carrying that when spirit comes through and gives them the messages or gives them the evidence of what they need to move on with their life, I believe that that's just healing. And I think it's healing not only for human in in the human existence that we have it's healing for spirit too i've had a lot of spirits come through that needed forgiveness and when they get the forgiveness then they can move on too so for me it's i i want to take the fear out of this for sure but i also want people to realize like you, you don't you don't really need external people helping you you know maybe someday and i always say this especially with the ones who are being born today i don't think people will need mediums in the future you know i think they'll just know that they have that connection and they'll be able to you know stay in touch when they need to where did your initial hesitation come from 
I know you said you came back like not really wanting some, any I of had this. Some awful, I had some awful experiences and one of them landed me in the hospital. Oh, okay. You travel around quite a bit, right? Is there any place that you've gone to that as far as just England. being over, overwhelmed England. with? London. London's the most haunted place I've ever been. My God. Oh, it is the most haunted place. I think because it's just so old. And what's interesting is I lived in England as a child and we lived in a monastery with St. Mary's and it was built in the ninth century. That's where I started having experiences as a, like a baby, knowing that there were other things around me, but not, you know, when I look back on it now, I can realize, oh yeah, it was probably spirit. But you know, when you're a couple of years old, you don't realize this stuff. But London, oh my God, that that place, I had so many experiences there uh, just a few years ago. And it was, it was just like, get me out of here. And are these <laughs> like audio or do you see things as well? Like what kind of experiences are you having? So I use all my clairs. So, and I think every medium needs to use every last clair. I, I see, feel, touch, hear, smell, see in my mind's eye, like everything. They touch me, everything. You use every clear because you need to, because that's how you communicate and that's how you'll be a really good medium. But I, you know, I, I've shared this story once before. I think one of the funniest ones is um, funny, strange and funny, haha, was when I was walking along in London, we came across this park. I was on a walking ghost tour, which most ghost tours, quite honestly, are not ghost tours. They're a joke. But we walked up into this area called Smithfield in London and uh, came upon a park. And it was just grassy area with benches and stuff. Looked really peaceful. And, you know, it was evening and I'm like, nope, I'm not going there. There's so much there because when I get overwhelmed, I feel like passing out. I feel like throwing up. Like the energy is just too much. So I'm like, I'm just going to go sit this one out and I'll catch up with you guys. So I went and sat down on a stoop by uh, a house with a basement and stuff. And I was looking at this boot scraper that was built into the sidewalk, which was really cool. Like how old was this thing? It probably was there in the 1700s. And the next thing I know, like all these spirits are coming up the stairs and I'm like, great. And you know, they're just floating towards me. And I'm like, I'm getting out of here because this is just way too much. We'll found out later on that in that peaceful green grass park, uh, I think it was 50,000 people were buried in a mass grave from the plague. So I'm like, oh, yeah, London. There's no question. If you want to go ghost hunting, just go to London. You'll encounter spirits on every corner. And not just one. You'll encounter thousands of them. <laughs> so I'm not going to London. <laughs> So here's the thing. You mentioned like the paranormal shows. I don't watch them and I, I haven't. And here's why. And John knows this. Most of these shows, it's just, they're just in rooms. And there's really nothing going on. But randomly, occasionally, they are actually in a space that has spirits. And anytime I'm just innocently watching these, it feels like someone dumped ice water over my head randomly because it's like, oh, there's something there. <laughs> and that's happened to me on um, TikTok when people are live streaming from places and I'm like, oh, okay, this is what it is. And then suddenly there was like a really random one where they're asking the spirit's name and I, I was half watching it and I was just like, its name is Paul. <laughs> and then I'm like, wait, what? How did I know that? And and then they were talking about something and it just kept hitting me. Like this Paul, like it was getting insistent that like it needed that its name to be correct because they were calling it something else. And so I don't normally interact on these. And I responded, his name is Paul because it was just <laughs> very that. prevalent. <laughs> and they're like, Paul. No, he's upstairs and he doesn't come down here. So, and I'm like, well, apparently, okay, sure. <laughs> They're like, Paul's a ghost upstairs and Paul, he doesn't come down here. This isn't his space. And I'm like, well, Paul says otherwise, but okay, sure. 
I can just picture <laughs> Ashley yelling, Paul, 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 stupid Paul. It's Paul. <laughs> but again, normally I'm not one to, <laughs> I just, it was, I happened to be scrolling and it hit me. And um, so I don't like to look at pictures of haunted I was gonna places say, yeah. or watch like the shows because if there is any presence, I do feel like someone dumped a bucket of ice water or sometimes I feel like um, needles like prickling my chest. And so kudos to you for going in with all your clairs open. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, I showed Ashley a picture of, of, of a place and she's just like, okay, nope. Can't look at these no more. We're good. Like, uh, nope. <laughs> I was just flipping through and then I'm like, Oh, nope. Take it, take it away. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, what's interesting is oh, Ashley, you, you have abilities, obviously when, when I'm at like a, I, I go and see a lot of famous mediums because I just like to watch people work. You know, I love to watch people do readings and stuff. So I'll go and watch, you know, Tyler Henry or Teresa Caputo or any of these famous mediums. And you link with them. So as a medium, you can't help but get spirit. So you're linking and you're doing the same reading. So that's what you're doing. You're just naturally linking during this. And you're like, of course, even though it's probably been recorded and it's not live. But you get that information. Yeah. Well, the thing that cracks me up is here you have all these paranormal investigators, and they've been doing this, you know, years and years. They have shows, and when they encounter something, they're afraid. And and for me, I'm just like, why are you afraid? You've been doing this 20 – like, I couldn't imagine being in a home, doing an investigation, and screaming <laughs> or doing something – you know, I, I think the people in the home would think I'm nuts or they would become afraid. So you have to be really, I guess, brave. And plus, too, you have to, like, check everything out. I, I think one of the funny ones is I had um, uh, two women in different homes next to each other that were having paranormal activity. They asked me to come in, calm the energy down. And when I got to the door, you could hear this awful rumbling and thumping. And it sounded like a room was like collapsing and they're all freaking out. They're going, oh, my God, see, they know you're here. You're a medium and they know you're here. And I said, it, it sounds like your washer is off kilter and it sounds like some bottles fell on the ground. Where's your laundry room? And so we went to their laundry room. And that's exactly what happened. And oh, I said, wow. there's a logical explanation for most things. <laughs> I love it. It knows you're here. It's going crazy. <laughs> they thought, oh, my God, all hell is breaking loose because Annie's here. And I'm like, I think your washer's off balance. <laughs> One thing talking about paranormal, uh, the names, when you said Paul – um, I, when I listened to that, that podcast that you were on, you had talked about, uh, middle names. Like whenever you hear, sometimes you hear middle names come in. And for me, um, for me, it's a very, it's a family thing. Like in my family, in my culture, um, especially, you know, generations past, a lot of my family members go by their middle names. They don't talk to each other by their first names. And so I thought that was pretty interesting. I thought, well, maybe, that's how it was. Maybe that's what, what's being channeled is that you're hearing their name, but that's exactly what they went by. Cause at least that's how it was in my family. Interesting. No, you know, I really think that spirit works with me giving middle names because I, I do think people are skeptical and, and I don't care. Like, I think it's great. You should be a skeptic. Just like the story I just told you, like, let's look for logical explanations. But uh, I think I get middle names because they're very difficult to like look up. It's just not common. Like I think people think that, oh, these mediums are looking at us up on social media, which cracks me up. I'm like, wow, have you ever tried to find an old friend on social media and how many people have the same name? Like, I just know this from trying to find one of my old friends and, you know, messaging people and they're like, who the hell are you? Or leave me alone, you know. So anyway, that to me, I think is ridiculous. But I do think the middle names come through because it probably is better evidence for spirit to share. It's just not as common. And a lot of times, too, people will say, I don't know their middle name. And then they get back in touch with me and will say, oh, yeah, their middle name was, you know, whatever. 
Yeah, I I agree with BJ. Uh, my family calls me by my middle name all the time, so it's not John or anything. It's just Thomas. Hey Thomas or Hey Thomas. <laughs> I do I do get um, nicknames sometimes. That's always interesting. And then a lot of, especially um, Ida, a lot of people who have parents who were not born in the United States and don't have, you know, they didn't speak English and stuff and get words and names and stuff like that from there that I just sound out phonetically, which is pretty funny. When I'm doing a reading, I'm halfway in trance. So I don't think that people, I don't think most mediums are really all here so it, a lot of times it's just a flow of information and sometimes stuff comes out of my mouth and I'm like, where did that come from? Because, you know, it's not my thinking mind. It's interesting too, in talking about that and talking about, you know, how the mind works and everything is I've been hooked up and I know other mediums have been hooked up to how their brain works and where it is when they're doing a reading and they found that when mediums are doing a reading, they are not accessing memory banks. So it's not part of their memory. It's a completely different area that they're accessing. So it's it's interesting that mediumship works much differently than people thought with the brain activity and how it would be. So you're not connecting you're not connecting to maybe a bias. Is that what it is? Thinking about like memories? So I'm not connecting with my memory banks, right? Right. I'm using a different part of my brain. Mm -hmm. It's a flow. It's For me, it's just a flow of information that comes in. Now, how do you incorporate astrology into what you offer? So for me, everything's connected. So as a psychic... You want to know, you know, sometimes you want to delve a little bit deeper. So you may pull out some tarot cards and tarot and astrology, psychic healing. All of these things for me are, are all the same thing. It's all about healing. So astrology is just something I've been fascinated by because I do believe it is a blueprint that you bring in about the karma, meaning the actions that you're going to experience on in this dimension. So it, it doesn't mean you have to experience it all, but it's what you brought in to maybe experience. So astrology has been something because if you look at life purpose, we all want to know why we're here, right? We want to connect with our loved ones on the other side. And then the next thing we want to know is why are we here and what's our purpose? And that's where astrology comes in for me because I think it can help lead you into where your life purpose might be. What did you come into this world to experience and how are you leaving this world? And what is the core of what you'll be doing here? So that's where astrology comes in for me. It's more about soul purpose, life purpose type stuff. Okay, I see. Is that like a, a soul contract thing, like for like with reincarnation? Is that something that you can connect to through astrology or is that something different? So soul contracts, it's it's that life between lives where you go and you talk to whoever you're re going to reincarnate with your soul group and those soul contracts that you have. I don't know that that's something that I would even share because how could somebody prove that? I typically only do the stuff that people can say, yes, I can connect with that. Like I don't read people's angels. I don't read your spirit guides. I'll help you connect to your own spirit, spirit guides and angels and soul contracts too. I think that's really personal to you. I don't think people can tell you what your soul contracts are. Now through past life regression, which is another thing I've been certified through Brian Weiss, um, past life regression is a great way to maybe experience lives and lives between lives to maybe see if you have a soul contract there. Because most people, when I regress them, go back and they're meeting people that look differently. And I'm like, okay, how do they look? But how do they feel to you? And they're like, wow, I think this is my brother who was my husband in a past life. And then it's, what did you experience in the past life? And what did you carry into this life? Which really isn't soul contract stuff. But I'm, you know, soul contract stuff is in there. What did you all decide to do before you incarnated here? Yeah, that's that. 
It, it does. It's and I've always been interested in doing the past regression, um, past life regression. I've done a, like a past life reading, which is obviously different. But the regression part, I think, would be really cool because it's, you know, it's hypnosis, right? And um, yeah, you're, I'm using a couple of different techniques. See, a past life reading, I personally would never do because how could you say yes or no? How could right. you, unless it really <laughs> resonated with you? So for me, I'm only doing things that if it's not connecting with you, then I, I, I'm I'm just not doing it. Um, a past life reading i i don't know how one would do that i don't know how somebody could tell you externally what your past life was i think you can do that yourself right. if you get my theme here i want you all doing everything for yourselves <laughs> without fear <laughs> Exactly, without fear. No, I do. I, I really want people to quit giving their power away to other people because you have it within you. You can do these things within you. Maybe not to the level that, you know, you probably don't experience mediumship the same way I do because I've been doing it for a long time. But, you know, maybe 20 years from now, you've been doing mediumship. You'll be at that same you know, ability to be able to help others in that way. But yeah. So we've talked about past life regression before, and I guess I've never asked, but it's never, I've never thought of it until now, but how <laughs> does it help to bring up the past life and the stuff that carries over? How, how does that help a person in the present life and go forward? One of my great stories and my great examples. I had a client, she did uh, training with me and stuff, and she did a couple of readings, but she did a past life regression. She did one or two with me. But in one of them, and before she did the past life regression, one of the things that I knew was that she was dealing with anorexia. So she had issues with bulimia and anorexia and eating issues. We went into a past life. I guided her through a past life where she was the king of the Druids. And in the scenario in the life that she was in, the English were coming and, or no, the Romans were coming. The Romans were coming and they had to stop the Romans or because the Romans was, were going to kill them. So as the king decided to sacrifice somebody and eat their brains, so they sacrificed somebody, ate their brains, but the Romans came and slaughtered them all. So that was her past life. After she did that, you know, for me, I don't know about Druids. I don't know about the Romans coming into England. I don't know about any of this history. She looks it up, and that actually happened. So she looked up the Druids, she looked up the Romans, and she looked up how they tried to stop and they would have done a sacrifice and they would have eaten the brains. So for me, I was like, you know, and I'm not a therapist, so I can't take her through the therapy part of it. But I said, hey, you know, maybe you want to look at this past life where you had to do something really unpleasant. You probably didn't want to eat the brains. And so maybe that's the karma, the actions that you carried into this lifetime with you, where maybe you're punishing yourself and not wanting to eat. You know, but like, I'm not a therapist, so I can't come from that point of view, but I can come from a past life for her to maybe look at it, maybe look at it with her therapist and stuff. But I find that really interesting. And when I take people through past lives, you see relationships and they're difficult relationships in past lives, and then they carry them into this lifetime. And I've actually had one who had a sister, a very difficult sister and stuff, um, who they had a past life with, and she realized something in that past life. It changed the entire dynamics of their relationship after that. So I think there's things that we just bring through. Another interesting thing for me that I love to look at is people's scars, because I think those scars are probably how you died in the past life. That is something that I've been really interested in with the past lives, that the scars and like how people have died, and that kind of influences maybe a little bit of what their fears are today, 
right? Like exactly. if you died in a if you died in a car crash, you're afraid to drive. Like plane plane crash, same thing. Fire, like all of that. And then you have these birthmarks that may be from something that happened to you in your past life. And I, I think that's super super interesting. So yeah, I do too. It it, it really fascinates it fascinates me too in the ones who have remembering. And I kind of, you know, in, in looking at this with like Raymond Moody and, and all the people who have studied past lives and everything of how um, sad it is that, that people remember their past life, because then I think it interferes in this life. I think it's nice to maybe tap on it, get an understanding of what happened. But then when, you know, there was a case of that seven-year-old boy who remembered his entire squadron and they all died in World War II. And so I think that's a lot for a young boy to have a remembering of. And he ended up meeting all of his squadron people that survived that and, you know, very famous cases like this. The other thing, too, about past lives, too, I've never met a Cleopatra. Everybody wants to be a Cleopatra. <laughs> I've never met anyone famous. I've never been famous. Uh, like just, you know, lives are very mundane. I think they're just, you know, really mundane. You learn something and you move on. It sounds like you had a pretty supportive community as you were coming into your gifts and really embracing them, right? No. Or did I take that wrong? <laughs> Let me rephrase that question then. Did you have a supportive community? No, not at all. No, I had no one too, you know. I, it, when I was coming up, it was there were there were no mediums out. I mean, there were only witches. I think that's why I embrace witches so much because that's the only thing that was around was witches and witchcraft books and stuff like that. But um, no, no, I, I my parent my not my dad so much, but my mom was very very Catholic. Uh, I think at every turn, my mom thought I was going to be possessed. And I was like, yeah, there's no such thing as possession. I was playing with Ouija boards. One of my friends, when they came over, in fact, she did a reading with me uh, like a year or two ago, for a childhood friend. She said the first time she came to my house, I said, hey, come on back. We're going to do a seance. And we were 10. And she's like, you just thought seances were the most normal things ever. And I'm like, well, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> but it wasn't, you know not supportive. People thought I was weird. And and I don't blame them. I think, you know, having abilities and stuff when you're younger and being a psychic and knowing things, you know, it's, it's weird. It's, it's weird, especially if you're in a religious type community. It's, you know, then it's like, oh, you're not allowed to know things. Only, you know, ministers, priests, and the Pope, and yeah, so the patriarchy. Do you think that has shifted, um, especially recently in recent times? Shifted in 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 what way Th that people are more accepting of mediums? Yeah, exactly. And in regards to, and especially like these days, in the past maybe 10, 15 years, do you think there's been any kind of shift or that people are more well, accepting? I, I I'm not sure if people are more accepting, but I think people like Jonathan Edwards, you know, who had a, a show. Um, Teresa Caputo having a show, I think it at least got it out there and started educating people and stuff. But, you know, I still have friends who don't believe in what I do, which it's all good. It's fine. You know, they still make fun of me and that's all good and fine too. I don't really care. But when they lose a loved one, who's the first person they call? Right. Yeah. When they want to know something that's going on and they can't really figure it out and they need help, you know, maybe a little bit of woo-woo out there, then who do they call, you know? So. Ghostbusters. Yeah, Ghostbusters. Sorry. <laughs> I had to. I'm sorry. No, I know. I have a bad sense of humor. Who are you going to call? No. It's a sense of humor. Um, so I think that it's probably – yeah, in the past 15 years, yeah, more accepted. Then, especially when I was a kid, like calling yourself a medium, you may as well said you worship the devil. <laughs> like, yeah, I think growing up, any time before now where New Age is starting to really be a little bit more tolerated, people have fear and they project it onto us, especially if you come from a religious background, which I did as well. And 
we internalize that fear as kids. And so then we're afraid of it. And that cycle has to stop. <laughs> like it, it needs to be normalized so we're not afraid of it. Well, you know, I think that's funny because uh, I know that my mother didn't want me doing this and I know society didn't want me doing this and I could care less. I love it. I wish I had been like you. <laughs> you know, I really think I'm the youngest of seven. And I think because, and, and I have mostly brothers, I have five older brothers. I think because of that male energy and having to stand, stand up to that male energy over and over and over again, I didn't back down. And I didn't care. I don't care if people like me. I don't care if people believe in what I believe. Like, I just don't care. I just don't care. So when I was younger and people were telling me, oh, you're a witch and this is wrong and all that, I was like, who cares? I, you know, I know what I know. Yeah. And you said it earlier, whether you're afraid of it or not, um, you can't shut it off. It's just not something you can shut off. And so it's going to be there. Like, I'm here, <laughs> annoying you in the background, um, no matter what you do. <laughs> you turn off the lights, see what happens. We'll be here <laughs> waiting for you. Oh, my gosh. Lord. <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm, t I'm very open with people. I sleep with the light on. My husband, I drive him nuts. He knows I have to sleep with the light on. Everywhere I go, I can never share a room with people because I'm like, I got to sleep with the light on. This is where I'm grateful I'm mostly not a seer because... <laughs> There have been a few instances where things pop out, and that's not great. But for the most part, I mostly just feel. So it doesn't matter if the lights are on and are off. Oh, <laughs> they'll throw things. They'll play with the <laughs> lights. They'll touch me. They'll show oh, gosh. up. Oh, yeah, I get all of it. Oh, it just makes me mad. <laughs> it just makes me mad. And I'm like, get out. <laughs> I mean, as long as you're able to get some rest, right? Like, I guess <laughs> there's, there's, you got to figure out a way to like sleep with the lights on, right? Like that for me, I've done that it would all be, my life. oof. Yeah, I've done it all my life. I mean, it's just, it's just a way for me not to be bothered. I just, it's just easy. At that point, they just sound childish. <laughs> They're just throwing things and pulling things like, stop it. I will send you to time out. <laughs> They want your attention so that, you know, when you ignore them, then they, they can get, you know, a little forceful, a little obnoxious. But that's where I, you know, you have to stand in your dominion and just go, get out. <laughs> get out. This isn't working. Get out. I've done that a few times. I haven't done it in the dreams. I have to practice that. But in the waking world, I have gotten annoyed. My fear gets pushed away by my annoyance. And I'm like, hey. I said, not in the bedroom, get out. <laughs> Wait, and and that's, that's part of it too. Like my bedroom is sanctuary. That's, that's where I go to rest. It's my place of sanctuary. I don't have crystals in there. Typically I don't have things that will keep me awake. I don't have things that will have a lot of energy and, you know, it's your place. So you make it that sacred place and they'll leave you alone. Uh, mostly. <laughs> Well, guys, this has been a really phenomenal episode. Like, I, I, I just looked at the time and I was like, we're already at an hour wow. and 16. This is amazing. This has been a phenomenal conversation. Do you, John, BJ, do you guys have any final questions or thoughts that you'd like to share with Annie? I just want to say thank you for joining us. You were great. There, we covered so many things, <laughs> and that that tends to happen um, with me personally because I'm all over the place with my ADD and everything. So, like I always like I always have these thoughts about all these different things: reincarnation, you know, paranormal investigations, like you name it. Like let's go <laughs> over it, right? P past life regression, like it's all it's all in play. And I'm glad that you were able to give us such great answers and talk about it freely and, and be positive with it. And, you know, cause sometimes it's, I'm sure it's not always, you know, grins and smiles. It's not always a good time. So, yeah. I am thrilled every day to wake up and do what I do and to be able to serve people and help bring healing here and on the other side and to help people make shifts and changes and realize that, you know, how powerful they are and how powerful they are in this plane and the things that they can do. Like you, you don't need other people. 
it's all within you. I'm I'm horrible for my own business, but <laughs> Which is like the worst transition because I was going to ask, where can people find you? <laughs> yeah, you don't need me, but you can find me. At, um, so you can find me on my website. Everything's there. And it's medium, Annie with an I-E, Larson with an R and an O. So it's mediumanniealarson.com. Yeah. And as much as people do have it within them, it's really hard to sort out, especially with the current age of information overload, how to tap into those resources within ourselves. So Annie, you have been a phenomenal resource just to us. So I encourage our listeners to go to Annie's website if you have any questions on any of the topics that we've talked about, especially past life regression. I feel like that's not something we could easily do ourselves. (laughs) Uh, yeah, I think that one might be a little bit hard. You you always want somebody skilled taking you through it. Yeah. Some of your um, your services, do you do them online or is it in person mostly? No, I phone sessions are my my most common way of connecting with people. So okay. I do phone sessions all over the world. Um, I prefer the United States because of the time differences. <laughs> But no phone. I do have an office. I have a beautiful office outside of D.C. And I do all the classes and all kinds of stuff there. But I do do online teaching, too. So I have I've trained people uh, in Japan. I've trained people in Europe. I've trained people in China and South America. It's pretty funny. I mean, again, I don't like those time differences so much. But yeah. With the uh, age of Zoom and Skype and all of that, you know, everything changed. Which I love. I love getting to be able to interact with people like yourself, just amazing individuals that teach us not to be afraid of our gifts and and are willing to be open and share on these topics. Because like you said, we're still in a world that isn't quite accepting. So it takes a certain level of courage and vulnerability to come and talk about these things. So thank you for being willing to come and have this conversation with us. Thank you for having me so much. I appreciate it. This has been great. All right, John Thomas. All right. Well, my final thought for the whole thing is, and I've said this before, don't feel uh, like you have to hide your weirdness, you know, embrace it, be weird. You're one of us. We love you here at 300 Podcast. (laughs) You are family when you are around us. So embrace that weirdness. Find your tribe and they will accept you the way you are. Thank you again, Annie, for coming on. Absolutely wonderful. I enjoyed this hour and 20 minutes now. Um, (laughs) Thank you guys so much. And thank you to all of our listeners for listening to this episode of 300 Podcast with your host. I'm John Thomas. I am Ashley Lunar Goddess. And I'm BJ Segura. And if you have any questions, comments, or episode suggestions, please feel free to email us at 300podcast at gmail.com. And if you haven't done so already, please like, follow, and subscribe to all of our social media. You don't want to miss amazing guests like Annie. Until next time.